Okay, guys, we will go ahead and get started. Hope everybody's having a good evening. Got your belly full. Got to worship a little bit, uh, recharge, and now here we are. We're going to jump in, so hope you're having a great week. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll, go, we'll get started. And I've got a few instructions tonight that hopefully will make things uh, a little easier as far as being able to hear. So I'll give you some instructions. But let's start uh, by going to the Lord, and let's, let's go to Him in prayer for a minute. Father, we pause here this evening uh, thanking you for this opportunity to, to dig into your word, uh, to understand, uh, God, our desire is to understand who you are um, in, in deeper ways. God, to, to see your character, uh, to see your attributes, to, uh, God, to allow you to teach us from your word. And so, God, I pray, pray this evening that your Holy Spirit would reveal truth to us. God, that it would be more than just knowledge that we gain tonight, but God, the things that we learn, God, would be things that you plant deep in our hearts and allow us to apply them to our lives. God, that we would be changed by the truth of your word. That, God, leaving here even this evening, understanding your holiness uh, in, in greater ways, God, that that would affect how we, how we live, how we view the world around us. Uh, God, and for our purposes tonight, God, that it would just help us to understand the richness uh, of the gospel and what you were doing uh, in redeeming fallen humanity in, in just incredible ways. Uh, God, help us tonight uh, to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So last week, well, first of all, instructions. I said I was going to give instructions. I'm going to do that. So this evening, there may be, we'll see how it goes. There may be some times that I, I invite you to do what we did last week, which is I'll give you something to discuss at your table for a few minutes, and you'll do that. And then I may open it up and say, hey, was there anything at your table that was shared that you want to share with the group uh, at large. We did that last week. Only problem was nobody could hear uh, what you said in the room because the room's too big. So tonight, I've tried to remedy that. There is a microphone uh, for the back row Baptist uh, back there in the back section around the rectangle tables. So um, it's right here in, the, in this aisleway directly in front of me. So if you get up to speak, just know I'm going to ask you to come to the microphone so that the rest of the room can hear the great words of wisdom that you want to share with the rest of the room. If you're in this front section here, over to my right uh, by the dessert table is the other microphone. So little incentive to go to that one. You can get up, you can share something, and then grab a fudge round on your way back to your seat. Okay? So little incentive uh, this evening when we, when we come to parts like that, okay? So that's the instruction. The microphone should be on, so you should just have to walk up, take it out of the stand, hold it up to your face. Don't hold it down here. It does not help down here. Get it up here, uh, and, and then share. Uh, share with the group when we get to those moments. All right, well, it's good to see you back this week, uh, and obviously we have several here who are for the first time, so welcome. I'm glad you're here. For review, we are now in week two of a study that we're going to go through for about 13 weeks called The Heart of God in the Gospel. And our aim over these weeks is to look at some of these incredible words that we use when we're talking about what is it God is doing in the gospel? What is it that he's doing in our lives? Uh, how, what does it mean that he's, just, that he's justified us? What does it mean that he's sanctifying us? This word that we use to say Jesus uh, atones for our sin. He has adopted us in his family. He has redeemed us. He has reconciled us. We've got all these words that we pull from scripture that help us understand what is going on in the gospel message, in this work of Christ to redeem us. But we, I don't think that we spend enough time understanding those words, what they mean, where we find them in scripture. And then I definitely don't think we pause long enough to say, and what 
do these truths reveal to us about the character of God? What does it teach us about his heart? Uh, and then how, what should it do then for our walk with God? Like, how should this change the way we study our Bible? How, should this, how does this change how we, our prayer life? How does this change the way we interact with the lost, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers? As we understand these truths and we just dig into the richness of the gospel, it ought to change us. It ought to just excite us and just fuel us with a passion uh, to not only know more uh, and understand in deeper ways, but then to live it out in, in greater ways. So that's my hope over these weeks, that that would be what happens through our study. And so last week, we began that looking at the holiness of God, starting with this foundation of, of what Scripture says about God. And what was it? Some of you... Um, I'm not going to make you go to the microphone for this because I'll repeat anything you say. What were some of the words that we said are great ways for us to define holiness? You, you guys threw out some great ones last week. What were they? You don't remember. Or maybe it's a whole new group and nobody was here. Uh, it's a whole new, new, new crop of people tonight than last week. Set what? Apart. A, set apart. Yes. Anything else? What does it mean? What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart. That's excellent. Sinless. Sinless. Yeah, that he is complete in and of himself, needs nothing. He lacks nothing. He is self-sufficient. Um, perfection, sinlessness, set apart. Good. Right? And we spent a lot of time looking at just some of the attributes of God. We looked at scripture passages that just talk about his holiness. And then we, we looked at how that theme of holiness, how we see it all through, we look through the Old Testament to see that through the commands of God, the moral law that he gave to Moses, how the holiness of God is kind of the foundation under that. Like as he's giving this law, we are meant to see God's standard of holiness, his standard of perfection. We see his holiness in even with the tabernacle and the temple uh, and the way that man in his sinful state could not come into the presence of God. Uh, we looked at like some of the visions that some of the characters from the Old Testament had when God, like at the burning bush with Moses, uh, Isaiah, when he sees the Lord Jesus in the in, on his throne high and lifted up. We see these incredible, this incredible imagery and these descriptions of the holiness of God. We see judgments all through scripture where God is judging. And we see that right at the root of that is, is God's holiness that God demands that sin be accounted for, right? That sin, a holy God cannot just excuse sin to turn his, turn his, turn his back and say, well, I'll just look the other way, right? Or all right, you, all right, I'll let it go this one time, uh, but you guys knock it off and, and you don't do that again. Like, like a grandparent, right? God is not a cosmic grandpa that just says, you know, you can do whatever you want, and if you just bat your eyes and, and smile, you can get away with it. No, God is holy. Sin, he, because of his holiness, sin must be dealt with. It, it must be accounted for. And so we see that even through some of these judgments. God is, his holiness is, is on display, right? We see what happens, like the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. Um, we saw responses, of individuals when they encountered the greatness and the glory of God. We're going to see that again today as we, as we keep going. But then we looked at an incredible truth last week, and this is where we ended last week, was that to preserve, preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever would destroy it, right? And so God must destroy sin. And then we saw just the the most wonderful thing, the most marvelous thing is that that wrath of God that must destroy sin because it would destroy his creation. He poured out his wrath on his own son. The holiness of God poured out his wrath on the son of God so that you and I could be redeemed. Yeah, so I think 
too many times we, we don't take seriously enough the holiness of God, but scripture is full of warnings and admonitions that we should take it seriously and we should understand it and what God is doing. So tonight, my hope is that we're gonna see a little bit more of that as we kind of wind down our couple of weeks looking at the holiness of God. So you're gonna need a Bible tonight. Um, so either get your Bible app out and be ready to, to plug in passages or, or get out a copy of God's word uh, and be ready to turn because we're going to really kind of comb through some scriptures. And I want you to be able to follow along with me as we look at these. I've given you room to write the references down. If it's helpful for you just to listen and you're going to go back later and look at those passages, that's okay too. Uh, I'm going to put the references we talk about on the screen so that you can uh, write some of them down that you don't already have in your notes, um, and then you can go back and look at these throughout the week. But the first thing I want you to see here in Scripture is that we see the driving passion of God from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, God's desire <coughs> to make the universe a holy dwelling place for himself. And again, this I just want to go ahead and lay this disclaimer Tonight is probably going to make you uncomfortable, okay? So can you just get good with being uncomfortable this evening? Because um, it makes me uncomfortable. Because our fallen state, our sinfulness, and even some of our Americanized uh, Western understanding of Christianity, we make it very man-centered. We make it about us. And the Bible is in no way, shape, form, or fashion about us, right? It is, help. It is about God. This is his story, right? It is, it is God-centered. And so for us, and that's why one of the reasons when we study the holiness of God, if we don't leave a little uneasy, right, we're probably not digging in like we should because the holiness of God should really make us uncomfortable when we see, because it's going to expose to us how unholy we are. And so I just want to prepare all of us tonight, including myself, as we talk about this, uh, that you may be stretched a little bit tonight. I'm going to be stretched a little bit tonight, even as I, as I think through these truths and these passages again. But God's desire, right, as we read through scripture, you are going to see that God's ultimate desire is to make the universe a holy dwelling place for himself. Open up your Bible. Here we're going to get started here. Psalm 19 verse 1. Listen to what David says. He says the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And we could go on and read through the first 5 5 or 6 verses of Psalm 19 and we could see right what that creation itself what is the purpose of creation? It is to proclaim the glory of God, right? It, it is for his glory that he created the world. And it says creation proclaims the glory of God. And then if we flip in our Bibles and we go back and we start combing through the first couple of chapters of Genesis, we're going to see exactly this truth that God's desire was to create a holy dwelling place for himself when he created the universe. Genesis chapter one, verse 28. We call this passage the creation mandate. Let me read it for you. It says, God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God, as he is looking at Adam and Eve in their, their sinless state, he says, you are my image bearers. Your job is to fill the earth with more image bearers. So what does that mean? They are to fill the earth with his image, right? God is creating this dwelling place, this holy dwelling place for himself. And Adam and Eve are part of that. He goes, you were, you were to have dominion, right? You were going to rule the earth under my authority, but I'm giving you the authority to rule, to have dominion, to fill the earth and subdue it and fill it with my image bearers. 
That is God's desire. That is God's intent from the very beginning of creation. And when God gets to the end of the creation process, look at Genesis chapter one and verse 31. Look at what he says. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was what? Very good. It was perfect. It was perfect. But then in Genesis chapter two, one through three, if you want to see more, I want to read this for you because this is important. And sometimes we miss this. Starting in verse one of chapter two, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Six days of creation and God rested. Did he rest because he was tired? Did the creative process wear him out? No. Why did he rest? What should be our understanding of this word rest? If you, were, if you did the thread study with Pastor Jason and I, you know this. So just dig back in the, the recesses there and pull it out. When we're looking at rest, what are, we, what are we understanding? It's a thread that runs through Scripture. Completion, yes, right? Everything was as, <coughs> excuse me, as it should be. God rested because the work was done. It was complete. And so he rested from his work. Another indication that the world that he created was without sin. It was a dwelling place for himself, we even now see as we move, I want you to move on to Genesis chapter three now. In Genesis chapter three, typically we just say, this is the, this is the story of the fall. This is where Adam and Eve chose to de-God God. They wanted, they wanted to be like God. The, the, the lie of all lies from Satan is that they were already created in the image of God, but they did not want to submit to God. They wanted to be on the throne themselves. And so this temptation that they would know, that, know what God knows, that they would know good from evil, right? They buy it hook, line, and sinker. They take the bait and they choose to sin. Look at verse 7. It says the eyes, the results of this, the result of their sin in verse seven, it says the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And so in their shame, it says they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths or coverings for themselves. Right, immediately we see this perfect dwelling place that God had created for himself that Adam and Eve could enjoy now it's broken. And I want you to look with me as we keep going here. Um, verse eight, it says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. See, God was walking with his creation, with Adam and Eve. Like this is the beauty of this sinless state for the whole, for holy God that he could dwell with his creation in the garden. But look at what has now happened. As God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the man and his wife, verse eight, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the first response that they have to holy God now in their sinfulness is to what? It's to hide. They respond by hiding from his presence. And it says the Lord in verse nine called to the man and said to him, where are you? Verse 10, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was, what? Afraid. What's the next response to the holiness of God? Fear, to be afraid, to tremble. So Adam and Eve, they're feeling guilt and shame, so they cover themselves. And then when God is walking and he calls to them, they hide and they're afraid. So now we're beginning to see just how the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man 
right? This, this relationship that has now just been fractured and it gets worse, right? God drives them from the garden, right? Because this is the dwelling place for God and sinful man cannot be in the presence of God. So he drives them out of the garden, right? In, in, in mercy, right? In mercy, he does that. First of all, he provides more suitable, uh, durable coverings for them because they are sinful. They are guilty. They do have shame because of their sin. And so God clothes them to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame, and he drives them out of the garden. This is not God being angry. This is not God being cruel. This is God being merciful, driving them out of the place that they cannot be because of their sin. He's having mercy on them in this place. And then creation just begins to unravel. If we were just to continue to flip chapter by chapter through Genesis, we would see the sinfulness of man and how destructive they are to themselves. Adam and Eve's Eve's oldest son murders the second born. We have the first murder. Um, It continues and it continues. Flip over to Genesis chapter 6. The evil, the sinfulness continues just to get worse and worse until we come to verse five and six of Genesis chapter six, where it says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. He saw their evil. And it says he regretted even making them. And his response, look at verse 17 of chapter six. For behold, this is God, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Why? Because it's not holy. Everything is on the earth, it shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you talking to Noah, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So in this moment, right, of God's wrath, his holy wrath, bringing judgment on the wicked sinfulness of man on the earth, even in that we are seeing his grace and his mercy to make a covenant with Noah to say, I will preserve you and your family because you among all the peoples of the earth are righteous. You are striving to honor God with your life. And so he says, I'm gonna start over with Noah. It's this, and it's, it's, we're meant to see this picture that maybe, maybe if God starts over with a good man, that maybe the earth, if we have a fresh start, can be a suitable, holy dwelling place for God. How does that work out? Not good, right? I mean, even Noah himself, he's a sinner. He is not holy. So when a sinner gets off the boat, the sinner sins, right? And so now we have Noah uh, in a garden after the flood, naked and ashamed in his tent and drunk. Um, And so we see this sinfulness of God. Noah is not the hope that the world needs, right? Noah is not the answer to how can the earth be this holy dwelling place for God. And so the world continues on. Flip over to Genesis chapter 11. It's a familiar story, right? This is one we hear in children's church and Sunday school uh, as kids, the Tower of Babel. But I want to draw your attention to a couple of verses here. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, look at why the people of the earth set out to build this tower. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. What was the creation mandate? To fill the earth with the image of who? God. What is their desire? To fill it with the name for themselves. 
right? You see, you see how the sinfulness of man just wars with the holiness of God. Man, even, even now they've started over, but here we are and they are still saying, we wanna make a name for ourselves, not for God. And so then you look in verse eight, look at God's response. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth and they left off building the city. Another merciful act of a holy God to say, you are going to destroy yourselves. You are your own worst enemies. You need to be, you know, and so he disperses them. He confuses their languages and they scatter uh, to stop this, this goal they have uh, to build this name for themselves because God knows that that is what will destroy us. It's when we strive to worship and fill our lives with anything that is not him. Right? We want to worship ourselves, not a holy God. And we see that in, in, even in this story here. So maybe now that the nations are scattered, now that the languages are scattered and people are dispersed, we come to Genesis chapter 12. We come to God's call on Abraham, Right? Sin in the garden, God drives them from the garden. The earth just gets more and more wicked. So we start over with Noah. Maybe there will be hope there. Maybe Noah is that promise that we need in order for things to be made right. Noah is not the answer. The world continues to do the same thing that Adam and Eve were doing in the garden, de-godding God. And so God says, I'm gonna choose Abraham. I'm gonna choose this man, Abraham, and I'm gonna make a covenant with him. Right, so God's going to focus in on this family, and through the family of Abraham, he says, I am going to bless all the world through him. Guys, this is where we really start. We see this plan of God continuing to unfold, that God says, listen, Abraham, you're a pagan. There's nothing special about you. There's nothing about you that I should choose you, but God says, I in my sovereignty am going to choose you, verses 1 through 3 of Genesis chapter 12, and I am going to make a great nation out of you who have no children, by the way. So it's all the work of God that is going to accomplish what he desires to do. And he says, and I am going to bless all all the nations of the earth through your family. It's a reference to Christ. It's a reference to the fact that the Messiah will come from the line of Abraham. And we're gonna see as we unpack that, that this is part of that plan of God is redeeming the world to make it a holy dwelling place for himself. And we see that covenant initiated with Abraham. God makes this promise with Abraham. Abraham, he sins, he lies, he tries to do it his own way. There's flaws with Abraham, but God continues to work through Abraham and his family. We, could, we don't have time tonight to go through the whole history of Israel, and I don't, you know, don't want to make you just sit here and have your eyes glaze over, but think with me for a minute. From Abraham through the end of the Old Testament, what are, what are some of the headlines that we, that we think about, about God and the children of Israel throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Shout them out. I'll, I'll repeat them so you don't have to get up for this. Jessica. What? Exodus. Yeah, Exodus, right? They, they end up before, even before the Exodus, they're in slavery in Egypt. God has to deliver them. They're, and then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. Okay, so there's, there is a, a moment in their history other things that we read about, about Israel? What are some of those things we know about them? They backslide. They backslide. Yeah, read the book of Judges. <clears throat> and that is a snapshot of what they do all through their history, right? They sin, they, they rebel against God and they sin. God, in order to get their attention, sends in an enemy that will take them captive they see their sin. They see the, the, the problem. They, they cry out to God for mercy. God sends a deliverer, a judge to come and deliver them from their, their bondage, from their captivity. And then they have rest and things are good. But then what do they do? That cycle in judges continues. They go back and they do it all over again. And each cycle is worse than the one before. And the season of rest gets shorter and shorter between each cycle, 
right? Their sinfulness, it is destroying them. So we see that over and over again, this cycle of, of rebelling and, and backsliding. And God has told them, like, you were my people, right? I am your God. I will bless you if you will obey me. If you will obey my commands, I will bless you. You will be my people. I will be your God. But time and time again, they cannot do it. They cannot keep their eyes on the Lord. They continue to go back to idols uh, and reject holy God. All through the Old Testament, we see this pattern, even with the kings and then the divided kingdom, and then God sends prophets uh, to his people to warn them of what is coming, that holy God will not be mocked. He has told them what to do. He has clearly spelled out in the law that they should obey him, that they should not run after other gods, Right? God uses strong language uh, when he talks about them running toward other gods. He says, you will not whore after other gods. But what do they do? They do that very thing. And God says, if you keep this up, I will judge you. I will send your enemies in to take you captive. You will be driven out of your land. That land was a sign of God's blessing and promise on them. And he says, you will lose it all <laughs> because God is holy and he will not be mocked. But they, they do the very thing God warns them time and time again through the prophets not to do. And so by the end of the Old Testament, they are out of their land. They have no land. They have no temple. So the dwelling place for God among his people has been destroyed, and they have been taken captive. So you get to the end of this story, and you see two things in the Old Testament very clearly the destructiveness of sin, and that as human beings, we are so prone to wonder, right? Like the, like the old hymn says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, right? We see that clearly in the nation of Israel by the end of the Old Testament. But the other thing sometimes I think we miss is that we see the holiness of God because he is punishing sin, Sin must be dealt with. That is a strong message of the Old Testament that we, that we need to wrestle with and we need to understand is that God's standard does not change, right? He demands holiness in order for him to make his dwelling with man. He demands holiness. So then we come to the New Testament. So, <coughs> excuse me, flip to John chapter one. Here's your assignment for a few minutes. I'm going to give you a break from listening to me for a few minutes. I want you at your tables. I want you to read verses 1 through 14. Okay? Look at John. I want you to look at John 1 through 14 together. And here's what I want you to do. After we've just kind of done a quick run sprint through the Old Testament, how we see the holiness of God, how we see the sinfulness of man, we have our statement from the beginning here that in Scripture we see this driving passion of God from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation to make the universe a holy dwelling place for himself. I want you to talk at your table of how John in his gospel, as he introduces Jesus, how this passage fits in to that statement. I'll, I'll put the statement back up on the screen. How do we, how is what John describes in the first 14 verses part of this plan of God? That's what I want you to talk about at your tables after you read this passage. I want you to read it, think about it in this light, discuss it. I'll give you about seven minutes to kind of do that together. So you can read it to yourselves um, and, then, and then discuss, okay? Let me give you a minute or two to do that. All right, let's, let's wrap up conversation for right now. Focus back up here. Um, 
<clears throat> this will be a moment I want to give you if you're willing to come to a microphone. Let me get, I want two volunteers, to, Max, because for sake of time. Uh, but anybody want to share what your table was talking about, how we see uh, John chapter 1 fitting into this understanding that what God is doing in, in Scripture, um, God making a people for his own possession, right? That he is, that he is doing this, um, well, I'm skipping through here. Let me go back. There we go. That God's passion from the beginning to make a universe, a holy dwelling place for himself. Um, how does John chapter 1, first 14 verses fit into that? What did you guys, anybody want to share with the group? Thank you, Danny Ball. Well, we, we came up with a couple of different things, and, and we started off with when you mentioned earlier about the completion when we talk about rest, this is the completion of God's plan having Jesus. And if you look at it, when we started in Genesis, God was walking in the garden with Adam. Now, with Jesus, he is walking with us. In your words, he's tabernacling. Tabernacling? Okay. With, with I'll us. accept it. And, and so we, we did that as one piece. And then we took a look at uh, verse 12. And we said, okay, we don't have to hide from God anymore. If we choose God, we reflect his light. And therefore, we're not sinning and we're not shameful. We don't have to hide. Okay. He, we make the choice to be with him and wholly like him. Okay. Although it is a growing process. And then we had one other piece, and it was, I'm losing my mind just a little bit. I'm tired. He, he, he chose us. So, again, we did not come to him. He came to us. Okay. Uh, and, and so, again, it's a completion of the plan. He came to the garden looking for Adam. Okay. And now he's come to earth to look for us. And so if we accept him, we don't have to be shameful. We don't have to hide. And then again, it's a completion of the plan because as we're walking with him when we accept him, just like we started in Genesis. So he's now made holy his creation again. Okay. Good. So there's definitely language. Thank you. There's language here that it excites you, doesn't it? Uh, anybody love John chapter 1, these first 14 verses? Yeah, these, these verses are meant, there's this anticipation. Something is different. Right When the word became flesh and dwelt among us in verse 14, it's you realize God is doing something, right? God has stepped in, right? The word has become flesh. He is here. He is, as Danny said, he is dwelling among us. This is a big shift, right? God has dwelt with Adam and Eve in the garden. But from that point forward, how had God dwelt with his people Israel in a what? in a tabernacle, and in a temple. There was a veil. There were all of these rules and, and, and rituals and, and, and things that had to be done ceremonially just to even be able to come even near to the tabernacle or the temple. And there were these incredible warnings that if you approach God in an unworthy manner, like you do so at the threat of losing your own life because God is holy. That is how God has related to his people all through the Old Testament. But now John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We've seen his glory, right? He is light. He is marvelous light. But this God has become flesh. The word has become flesh and dwelt among us. This is a game changer because now we're seeing the curse of sin is being reversed. Right? This holy God is the one who is stepping in to do something that we could never do with our sinfulness so that God can dwell with us. So this, this, should, this should be one of those places that's like, uh-oh, God is up to something. And then if we read through the rest of the Gospels, we see exactly what that is. That the sinless, perfect, holy son of God goes to the cross. We talked about this last week. God pours out his wrath on his son. Why? So that we could be made 
holy, so that we could be declared righteous, so that we could be the recipients of the love of God, ultimately, so that then this so the universe could be a holy dwelling place for God. This plan is, is in motion, and it's been in motion since before the foundation of the world, but now we see it takes center stage here as John says, Christ has come. And then, oh my goodness, flip over for a couple of minutes. We're going to do this quicker because I spent way too long on the first verses. But go to Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Jot down these verses. You can go back and look at them later in in detail because we're just going to go fast. But you are going to want to go back and look at these. But look at this. After Satan has been defeated... Right after the great white throne of judgment says in chapter 21 that there's a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and first earth had passed away. But look at verse three. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, what? The dwelling place of God is where? Is with man. He dwells with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. This is taking us back. This is taking us back to this place where God could reside with man. Why? Because sin has been dealt with. Sin has been paid for. God is victorious. He is on the throne. Satan has been defeated once and for all. And now what does that mean? God can dwell with his people. Look at verses four and five, this description of what that's like. He'll wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. There'll be no mourning, no crying, no pain. Those former things that passed away, all of those things are the result of sin. Sin has been eradicated. So now God can dwell in this perfect holiness with his people. Look at verses 22 and 27 of chapter 21. Well, 22 through 27. It says, even in this temple, I saw no temple in the city. Why? Because the temple is the Lord God. He's there. He doesn't need a temple. He is there dwelling with him. It doesn't need, the city needs no sun or moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates the whole place. By its light, nations walk and kings of the earth bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut. There'll be no night there. They will bring into the glory and the honor of the nations. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life are those who've had the blood of the sinless, holy Son of God applied to their hearts and had their sin atoned for. They have been redeemed. They have been purchased, bought back, and now they are holy. They've been declared righteous. And so what does that mean? They can dwell with God. He can dwell with them in this place of perfection. This is how the Bible concludes. It concludes this way. And then in chapter 22, I love verse four. It says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They'll need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever with him. They'll reign forever and ever. So I want you to understand something here. In verse four of chapter 22, look at their response Now, in the new heaven, in the new earth, when sin has been eradicated and God can make his dwelling with them as his people, look, it says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. What is missing? Last week, every time we saw someone encounter the holiness of God, even if it's you know, even if it's just a glimpse, you know, even from a distance, what was always their response when they saw the holiness of God? Overwhelmed, Overwhelmed, afraid, terrified. You know, woe is me. I am undone, right? Isaiah is like, God, just strike me dead. Like, I, I, I cannot see this, right? I am overwhelmed by seeing even just a vision of your holiness and your glory. But here, it says they're looking at his face. 
They are beholding him, right? Isn't this incredible? What God is doing, what he has done, the work of God, this has been, this has been his plan from the beginning, and we see it in Genesis all the way to Revelation that God is making this dwelling place, the universe, his holy dwelling place. And we get to be the recipients of the blessings of that. And he is the one who has done it all. It is not the work of man. It is just the work of God to accomplish this. Flip the page. I want you to look at a few things with me here. The consummation of this desire completes that which was lost in the garden. We've talked about that. And that which was redeemed most fully in Jesus. Not only is God making the universe a holy dwelling place for himself, but he is making a people for his own possession that would be at home in his presence and in his holiness. That's what we see in Revelation. God is making a people for himself that would be at home there with him as the light that illuminates everything, enjoying the presence of God without sin. And that's exactly, we see glimpses of that with the children of Israel. So I've given you a couple of passages here. We're not gonna take time to go look at those, but take a picture of this or write this down for just a minute. Uh, while I'm talking, you, you'll have a minute or two here to write this down. But in, um, let's we'll start here. In Exodus chapter 19 and chapter 20, we see this is where the 10 commandments are given. Israel is at Mount Sinai with um and God is going to give them the law. He is, he is this covenant that he is making with them. This is a lot of language that feels like marriage language. Like God is, is this, he's marrying his people. He's saying, listen, if you will obey me, right? If you will, I'm gonna give you the law. And if you will obey the law, I will bless you. I will provide for you. Like I will fight for you. Like you will be my people. I will care for you. Your, your role is to be is to obey, and God gives them the law. And this incredible scene at Mount Sinai, we see some of the glory of God in this place. But look at verse 4 in chapter 19. It says, you yourselves have seen what I did, right? You've seen that I bore you and brought you to myself out of Egypt. Verse 6, why? You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what God was desiring to do with Israel. He talks about that with them again in Deuteronomy before they are about to enter the land. God is reminding them of this plan that he has to make them a holy nation, a set apart people for his glory. But he's, his desire is to make them a holy people. And we see this all through here. It starts out with God saying, listen, in verse four, the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. He commands them to do it, right? And then how, does, how are they supposed to do it? Verses five through 25 of Deuteronomy chapter six say, basically, you need to be consecrated to the Lord. How you live matters. If you're gonna be a set apart people for my glory, if you're gonna be my holy nation, this royal priesthood, you must consecrate yourself. You can't live any way you want to. You can't look at the nations around you and live like them and be my people. You must be set apart. You must be holy. He calls them to be different from the pagans. Chapter seven, he continues this, these instructions to them as they're about to go into the land. Don't be like the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and all the other ites that are in the land. Why? Why should they not be different? Look at chapter seven, verse six. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. If we flipped over and took time to look at Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 through 28, he says, listen, behold, I've set two choices in front of you. You can obey and with that comes blessing. You can be my holy people. You can be set apart and you will be blessed. He says, or you can disobey and you can chase after God, other gods and you will be cursed. He says, I lay two paths in front of you to choose. 
And we've already talked about the path that Israel chose time and time again. But now I want you to flip over to the New Testament for the few minutes we have left together. Romans chapter 9. Paul's talking about Israel. Verses 6 through 8. It's who are God's people, right? Are they, are they the ones who can trace their bloodline back to Abraham? National Israel, are those God's people? Is that that holy nation, that royal priesthood that God has been creating and bringing to himself? Is that who this is talking about? Paul's talking about that here. He brings that topic up. He goes, is that who this is? Is it, is it Abraham's <coughs> physical offspring? Verse eight, this means that it is not the children of the flesh, the physical offspring who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Who are these children of promise? It's those who have placed their faith in Jesus, those who have had the blood of Christ atone for their sin. Those are God's people. That's those people who are being redeemed, who have been set apart to be this royal priesthood, this holy nation. God reminds them of their history. If you were to look at uh, verses 25 and 26 uh, in chapter 9, this is a reference back to the prophet Hosea and his relationship with Gomer. This is something we've talked about before. But, but in this picture, this is this graphic picture of how Israel just has wandered away from God and they have chased after other gods and they've made themselves a prostitute. And God says, because of that, you are rejected. I will show you no mercy and you are not my people. But then God tells Hosea, go get Gomer the one who has left you, this, this, this wife of yours who has made herself a prostitute, go get her and I want you to buy her back. I want you to redeem her. And there's a name change of these children. The, the name of Hosea's children are rejection, no mercy, and not my people. But when Hosea redeems Gomer, the names of the children, God says those names change to you are not rejected. You are accepted. I will show you mercy and you will be my people. Right? It's this incredible picture of what God plans to do in this work of making a holy people for himself to dwell with in a holy place where he can dwell with them. It is this idea that God is going to do it all. Right? He is going to be the one. We deserve rejection. God is going to bring us near. We deserve no mercy. God is going to be rich in mercy and rich in grace. We should be cast out. We should be cut off. God says, I'm actually going to adopt you and bring you in to my family. This plan of God has nothing to do with a Jewish bloodline. This has everything to do with the blood of Jesus that is making a holy people for himself. Peter picks up that theme. In 1 first, in, in first Peter chapter 1 and 2, this is a powerful, powerful passage of Scripture that I want you to look at with me for just a minute. Look at what he says. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last day. This living hope that is ours, why is it ours? Through Christ. How do we know it's ours in Christ? The resurrection is proof that God is doing what he set out to do from eternity past, and that was to redeem mankind, to make them a holy dwelling place for himself. There's a hope that we see here in verse five. It is secure. God's power is guarding this through faith, this salvation that is ours, that will be finally and fully realized 
in what we saw in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, when God is dwelling with us, where there's nothing that we have to fear. We don't have to tremble and be afraid of a holy God, but because we have been made new, because we have been saved, right? We can, we can enjoy the presence of God. We see this here. Look at verses 13 through 16 of chapter one. See if this language um, reminds you of anything. First of all, he says, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Do you see the same standard from what God was calling the Israelites to in the Old Testament? Be holy, be consecrated, be set apart. What is he calling us to be as his children, as those who have placed their faith in Jesus? Be holy, live set apart. Why? Because the holiness of God is a real thing. And if we have been redeemed, right, if God has, has saved us, if his grace and his mercy have been poured out on us so that we can be made right with a holy God, should we not want to live in a way that reflects who we have been made to be? He says, be holy as I am holy. Verses one, flip over to chapter two. So he, he continues this, put away all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, right? Instead, desire the pure milk, spiritual milk that is yours and grow up into your salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, right? As believers, as those who are following Jesus, right? We have been saved, we have been declared righteous, but we ought not to just push that aside and think little of that. We should remember what is ours, right? That we would grow into our salvation, that we would strive to live through the power of the Holy Spirit as those who we have been made to be in Christ, this holy people of God that are set there to reflect his glory and his image to the world around us. So he says, live that way, holy, Verse nine, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What does that language remind you of? Did we see that in the Old Testament? In Exodus and in Deuteronomy, where God says, this is what I'm doing for you and I. He's doing that with you and I. He is making us this holy people, this royal priesthood. What is it we are to do as this people of his own possession? We should proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into marvelous light. So as we, as we kind of wrap up thinking about the holiness of God, I told you I wanted us to, to always kind of end with what does this call us to do? What is it we need to understand from this? And here's, here's the thought I wanna leave you with and I want you to think about it. I've given you some more scriptures to read this week if you want to. But as, you, as we leave tonight, thinking about what Peter said, that we are to strive to be holy as he is holy so that we can reflect him, so that we can glorify him, proclaim his glory to those around us. What is practical holiness for us? Right, not like striving to live in a way that is set apart, not like the world, striving to honor God with our words and our thoughts and our actions and our attitudes. Why does that matter? Because the lives we lead are, are proclaiming a message to the people who are watching, right? As we, if we have been made holy, why would we not want to live like who we are? So that when people see us, they are seeing, they are seeing God glorified 
through our actions. That's why our holiness matters. That's why it's important for you and I to strive to live holy, to understand the holiness of God and to be in awe and reverence and wonder at the holiness of God, not to just come to him any old way we want to and say, Jesus is just my homeboy and you know we kind of got our own deal worked out. No, I hope over these two weeks you've seen he is God and we come to him his way or we don't come at all. And we should tremble in his presence because he is great and he is marvelous and how we live matters. But I hope at the same time, you also understand the great security that is yours because your holiness does not depend on you. It depends on what Christ did for you. And you have been now made righteous. You've been declared righteous. You now, when God looks at you, he sees the holiness of his son So why would you and I, who have had that as our story now, not want to live in a way that glorifies him with every action and word and thought, right? His church, we are called to be this holy, set-apart people that reflect his glory to the world around us. That is our calling, right? And it's, it's all built on this understanding of who he is and his holiness. So that's my challenge for all of us as we leave here tonight, as we understand that and get our conversation started about the gospel, is that we must start with understanding the holiness of God. So I hope you'll read a little more this week. Let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. We are out of time. God, thank you for this time we've had. God, there is so much we could say. There is so much we could study. Our time is just too short to to get it all in. But God, I pray that as we leave here tonight, your spirit would continue to do a work in our hearts through your word to help us to understand, God, how important it is that we would strive to live like who we are, a holy people, a royal priesthood that have been set apart to reflect your glory, to be your image bearers. God, as you were doing the work of redemption uh, in and through us, God, thank you for the day that is to come where we will dwell with you face to face, where we will behold you in your glory. God, what a day that will be. Between now and that day, God, may we live holy, set-apart lives as your bride, as your church, uh, so that when others see us, they would marvel at the goodness of who you are and the message of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Hope you'll see you back next Wednesday.